Welcome to this unique virtual CM event featuring alumnus Bill Martin. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator this evening, Vincent Bradley. Uh, Mr. Bradley serves as chair of the History and Social Sciences Department at CM. He has been an advocate of community-based experiential learning and organized lectures on campus with practicing historians. He was awarded the Excellence in Education Award by the Archdiocese of Boston in 2019. Recently, he has participated in the National Catholic Education Association's podcast focused on the unique challenges of teaching history during the 2020 election. Mr. Bradley is a proud husband and father of two young boys. Welcome, Mr. Bradley, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So it is my pleasure to serve as host of an evening with William Martin, a prolific and renowned writer. Mr. Martin is the New York Times bestselling author of 11 novels. His first Peter Fallon novel, Back Bay, established him as a master storyteller. William Martin places readers in history from the Mayflower in Cape Cod to the War Department in the Lincoln Letter to California of 1849 in Bound for Gold. The Providence Journal has called William Martin the king of the historical thriller. William Martin has been the recipient of the prestigious New England Book Award and the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award from the USS Constitution Museum. A 1968 Catholic Memorial graduate William Martin has been a familiar face to faculty and students over the years as a judge of writing contests and a featured speaker. I particularly enjoyed William Martin's talk on Abraham Lincoln for our scholars program a few years ago. William Martin's generosity of time and spirit and his connection to our community explains the overwhelming response to this event. And so on behalf of the Catholic World community, I would like to extend a warm welcome on a very cold night to William Martin. Welcome. Thank you, Vin. I am glad to be here and welcome to all of my friends at Catholic Memorial to my office where I spend most of my time on this very computer making stuff up. <laughs> uh, it's nice to talk to everybody here tonight. So Bill, I've been looking forward to this. I think this will be a real treat. Um, we had a number of different people involved in this call. We have current students and parents. Um, we have uh, some faculty and administration. And uh, certainly we have uh, alumni as well um, and, and, and just general fans of your work. So, uh, so thanks so much for doing this. And we thought we would try to curate some of the questions that people sent in as they registered. Um, and, and organize the evening where we talk a little bit about your personal background and your, your Catholic Memorial experience, a little bit about the writing process, and then, and then spend the latter half of our conversation speaking about Abraham Lincoln yes. and your, your phenomenal book, The Lincoln Letter. That's okay with you. Sure, sure. So, so tell us, where, where did you grow up and what was early life like for you? Well, I, I grew up... Uh on Corey Street in West Roxbury, uh, and then over in Roslindale on Bradfield Avenue. And uh, so I am a local boy from, from day one, basically. And uh, being an only child, I entertained myself a lot by reading. And uh, obviously, if you can see all the books around here, uh, uh, by reading and, uh, and going to the movies falling in love with storytelling and falling in love with big stories on broad canvases is the term I like to use. When I was a kid, the movies that, that we went to were things like The Alamo and Ben-Hur and Spartacus and Lawrence of Arabia and on and on and on. Movies like that, that showed you characters with enormous dreams and enormous visions, um, who turned out to have feet of clay. And, uh, and something about all of that stuck in my mind as a kid. This is just fantastic to be able to experience these other lives through storytelling. And so 
that was really the where my interest in stories and in telling stories was born. And then of course it was, it grew and was nurtured over the years through Catholic Memorial and on into college. Sure. And so you made your way from, from Corey Street to, to mm -hmm. Baker Street to Catholic Memorial. Yep. And um, what did you learn uh, about- By way of the Robert Gould Shaw School, which I think it has a different sure. name. I think it's called the Linden School now. Sure, yeah. You know, given the significance of Robert Gould Shaw in, in American history, they probably should have kept the name on that on that school. Um, but anyway, I stopped there on my way down the hill down to Catholic Memorial. It, and it, what did you learn about writing at Catholic Memorial in your time here? You would be surprised how much I learned. I had terrific teachers. I had uh, the great Chris Jackson. I had... Uh, mm -hmm. Ben Hopkins, Brother O'Sullivan, somebody that people probably don't remember too much because of course, let's face it, it's 50 years ago now. Uh, and what I learned was first of all from them, the discipline of writing mm. that, that you don't just, you, you can pour your thoughts out on the page but then you'd better rewrite them. Then you'd better, better approach them a second time with, uh, with a higher level of expectation of, about your own expression and your ability to express yourself. And, and so I can remember we were flabbergasted as freshmen when uh, we had just come out of the various middle schools that fed into Catholic Memorial at the time. Uh, Holy Name and St. Teresa's and kids from Dorchester and oh, probably all the same kinds of student body attendees that you have today. And, uh, um, and in walked, uh, I call him Professor almost, Professor Hopkins. And he, he had us listen on the first day to a short story called A Cask of Amontillado by uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And then he told us exactly how we were going to analyze it and break it down. And we were going to work with the style of it and the characterization of it and all of the various elements that go into a story like that. And when we were done, not only would we understand that story, but we would begin to understand the process of expressing ourselves. And that is why, uh, that, and, and that's what we learned from the beginning at Catholic Memorial. Uh, and it's what I teach and preach when I teach writing occasionally as I do, that even if you aren't going to become an, uh, an author of New York Times bestsellers or a famous sports writer or uh, a great screenwriter, you are going to have to express yourself throughout your life and if you can understand how to create a paragraph that takes the listener or the person who's reading your email, uh, regardless of the subject of that email, if you have to create a paragraph and you understand the, the, the principles of a topic sentence, of a middle that expresses the big idea, and then a conclusion, you're a mile ahead of almost everybody around you. And, mm -hmm. and that was what they hammered us with from the beginning. And, they, and so not only did we study grammar, we studied all of the uh, nuances and niceties of language, uh, right down to the Oxford comma. You know, sure. there's always this argument about when you have three words in a series, do you put comma, 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 or do you leave that last comma off? What I learned at Catholic Memorial was, we believe in the Oxford comma. <laughs> and so in any one of my novels, if there are three words in the series and they're all joined by, end, end with the comma and the and, there's always a comma after every word. You know, so we went from the smallest things like that to the most enormous things. The, the discussion, the discussions of, Shakespeare's history plays that we studied very closely when we were 
I, I think juniors at Catholic Memorial. And of course, to somebody who was interested in the historical fiction he'd been seeing in the movies, this was like mother's milk to me to yeah. sit there and study Shakespeare telling these amazing stories of history and then learning that in most instances, Shakespeare was shaping and playing with these ideas and Richard III wasn't quite as bad a guy as he was made out to be, so forth and so on. So when you ask me about Catholic Memorial and my, uh, m the things that I learned in English classes, I could go on all night, but then we wouldn't get to talk about Lincoln. No, that, that's great. And um, mm -hmm. when, did, when did you take that confidence you got from the classroom and the, you know, the instruction and the imagination? When did you yeah. start to think that maybe you could be a writer yourself and, and, and perhaps make a living at it? Well, uh, the making a living part comes years later. But <laughs> at Catholic Memorial, I was also encouraged by... Uh, Brother O'Donnell, uh, who ran the club and sport news at the time, uh, which was the school newspaper, which was run off on a mimi, not a mimeograph, it was a, a, another type of um, printing system. Uh, and he had a printing club. They were actually devoted to, to printing the paper, but they needed material to print in the paper. And so I became uh, a writer for the club and sport news. And the next thing I knew, I was the editor of the club and sport news. And so we were covering all of the, uh, uh, the great CM sports teams of the time. Uh, that included uh, good football teams, the great Ronnie Perry basketball teams with, sure, the, sure. Uh, with, uh, and I, and I was, I played on the teams, but I made uh, I didn't make it past the junior varsity. And when I made the varsity as a senior, I said, I'm just going to sit at the end of the bench here watching Franny Costello and all these guys that are going to the pros, watching them win all the basketball games. So I think I'll go over and, and, and just focus entirely on, on writing for the club and sport news and editing the club and sport news. And um, it was probably the right decision for me to make, I guess. Although occasionally when I, uh, have met um, Ron Perry, and I see him occasionally. I, I, I was very impressed, by the way, that uh, that Mr. Perry, and many there at the school today will still remember him. Many of you who are listening tonight will remember him. Ron Perry showed up two springs ago for our 50th reunion, the class of 68 uh, 50th reunion, just to say hello and uh, and wander around the group. But he, his wife, his late wife would always say to me, you know, <clears throat> every time you write another book, you become a better basketball player in his memory. <laughs> and um, I've always gotten a kick out of that because when I was a senior, all I did was write about the basketball team. Yeah. And our club and sport news had some pretty good writers on it. Uh, Charles Kenny, who later wrote a lot for the Globe and has written books. Uh, a guy named Greg Kilday, who uh, just recently retired as the chief movie critic for Variety. Now, you, you may not know about that unless you follow the movies closely and the, and the movie business, but the chief movie critic for Variety is the first person who sees a movie uh, when it's about to be released and renders a judgment and in the process of rendering the judgment tells all those people in Hollywood uh, exactly how they ought to market the movie. So he, he ended up with tremendous uh, power, even if it was kind of tangentially, uh, he ended up with tremendous power in the movie business because he could write and he was a terrific writer and, uh, and only recently retired, as I say. So editing the club and sport news was the place where I learned to understand that I could do this in a, in a world outside of uh, the English class. Sure. And, and then when I went to college, um, well, my application to Harvard 
uh, written at Catholic Memorial, uh, described my dreams of becoming the next David Lean, the great movie director who made Bridge on the River Kwai and Lawrence of Arabia, oh, yeah. and, a, and a movie I was just watching the opening of a little while ago, uh, Dr. Zhivago. And, um, and that was my expressed objective coming out of Catholic Memorial was to go into the movie business. And I went to Harvard. And at the end of that time, I just said, I'm going to the USC film school. And this was, of course, at the time that George Lucas was there, John Milius, a lot of other people. I never met Lucas, but um, uh, it, was, it was the place to be. And when I got to the USC film school and looked around uh, at the, the career paths of those people who, had, who were just moving out of the, that school and into the real world, I said, well, the quickest way to get into the movie business is to write a good screenplay. Uh, it isn't to make an eight minute student film, although that's how Steven Spielberg got started. Uh, it isn't to make an eight minute student film. It's to, it's to present to a, to a producer or an agent, a 120 page screenplay. And they can look at it and say, wow, we could, we could sell this tomorrow. And so uh, I started writing screenplays and the first screenplay that I wrote was about the California gold rush. And that screenplay uh, ended up winning me the Hal Wallace Screenwriting Fellowship. Now Hal Wallace was a legend, still is. He produced Casablanca. How could he not be a legend? And, and a lot of other spectacular movies across a, a 40 year career. Didn't want to produce the screenplay that I wrote, but 40 years later, I turned it into this novel, Bound for Gold. Um, I took those characters and that plot and uh, created that novel, which was, it's my last novel, came out two years ago. Uh, so you never, that's another lesson about writing, guys, ladies, never throw anything away. <laughs> you may write something in, in the mid 70s that you will later uh, turn into a novel. But it was my dreams, my belief that I could write screenplays that led me to Hollywood. Uh, and of course, as everybody that enters into the world of any kind of art needs to know as they get started, uh, when, when somebody is telling you how hard it's going to be and how unlikely it is that you're going to succeed at it. And this can be writing, it can be, it can be sculpting, composing, doing anything. You have to think um, like Han Solo in the first Star Wars. Don't tell me the odds, <laughs> no, because, it, because you don't wanna know the odds. You need to have what I call the arrogance of naivete. Well, I can do it. <laughs> if that guy can do it, I can do it. And I had that. And, um, and it carried me a long way. Now, fortunately, after I'd written a couple of screenplays that nobody wanted to produce, um, I came up with an idea for a novel. And it became that one, that's the original cover art right there. That's the artist working himself. That's the cover to Back Bay, uh, which came out in 19, uh, 1980. And uh, Back Bay defied the odds and made the New York Times bestseller list and stayed for 14 weeks. And people still read it uh, and yes. they, they enjoy it. And, and because of that success, I was able to um, solidify my, my spot here in this, in this room where I've, uh, I've probably been for the last 40 years, most of the time, either here or traveling in my imagination to some of the amazing places I've, and, and met some of the amazing people that I've had the opportunity to interact with in my imagination. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and you know, that's a, it's a good transition. We have um, a couple of students, class of 24, Antonio and James, and, um, 
uh, CM mom, um, Daphne, who sent several students to the school. They had a similar question, which I'm paraphrasing, but um, as you're sitting there in your writer's studio, how do you, how do you find the next idea um, for a story? How do, you, how do you develop that? Some of them, I guess you develop them years ago and then you get around to writing the book, but um, yeah. what's the process like for you? Well, the, 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 uh, the Bound for Gold story, the, the Gold Rush story, that's, um, that was a little bit of an anomaly, uh, but all of them in a way are anomalies. You never quite know what is going to inspire you to go down a particular road. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it's just uh, a plot hook will hit you. Uh, I've just finished a novel, a World War II thriller about uh, Christmas Eve at the White House December 24th, 1941, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill on the South Portico giving speeches after they light the Christmas tree. This is two weeks after Pearl Harbor. And uh, the idea for this n novel came to me when I was watching a movie. I was watching that movie about Churchill with Gary Oldman in it that came out a few years ago. Sure. And he's on the phone with Churchill. Or with he's Churchill and he's on the phone with Roosevelt and he's begging Roosevelt for help and Roosevelt can't give him help because of the American political situation and I just thought to myself there's a there's a story in here somewhere yeah. and I developed that story and it just came from watching that scene in that movie and um, and that sort of thing uh, happens sometimes sometimes you're just fated as with Cape Cod, right there. You're just fated to write a particular book. Um, when I was a kid, we had a summer home in Manomet. Sure. And I could spend hours, days, sitting on the front lawn, looking at Cape Cod Bay, and imagining what that, that span of water had encompassed across three, four, five hundred years. And that basically is what I wrote in, in Cape Cod. Um, Harvard Yard, another book over my shoulder there, a novel about the history of Harvard. My agent said, you know, wouldn't that be a great idea? A novel about the history of Harvard. And since my agent is the one that will go out into the world to sell my book to the publishers, I thought, well, I should listen to him. And, mm -hmm. and then a friend of mine was telling me a story shortly thereafter about the fact that William Shakespeare's William Shakespeare himself probably knew John Harvard's parents, both in Stratford on Avon and in London. And I thought, oh, this is too rich. Uh, and this is a place that I would like to go. And a lot of what I decide to do these days is, is about saying to myself, where do you want to go in your imagination? And maybe if we can ever get to travel again the way that we hope to, to go out and travel again. And I have some things lined up that I'd love to explore. And um, it'll all depend on which ones the publishers like. Uh, if they tell me that they want another novel about the Civil War versus a novel that follows a Roman centurion from... Uh, from Jerusalem to Rome in the first century, which is another possibility, uh, it will all come down to my deciding as, as to which of these that I would really want to write. But every novel has, has some uh, unusual genesis. It could be a plot hook. It could be a, just a strange idea that comes floating to you in the middle of the night. But I have to be careful about these things because these books take me a long time to write. I'm a slow writer. Uh, if I had, if I was getting a letter grade marked off for every month that I was late with a, <laughs> with my term paper here, and a lot of these things, they feel like monstrous term papers, you know, writing these novels. Um, I, I would have flunked every one of these books, but, um, 
but they've all turned out uh, pretty successfully and people are still reading most of them. And it's, and it's, it's a good feeling to know that something that you've worked on uh, 40 years ago, like Back Bay, is still being, uh, being read and enjoyed all these years later. So as I once said to a, an editor who was complaining to me about some the fact that Cape Cod was taking me uh, longer to copy edit, I said, you know, in, in 25 years, I expect that people will still be reading that book. Uh, they will have long since forgotten the efforts and the frustrations that went into the, uh, the writing and, the, and the, the editing of it so that it's just right. So let's make it right. Uh, yeah. Because we're not just doing this in order to hit a schedule. We're doing this to stick around uh, for some long span of time. And if you work in popular fiction and write popular fiction, which is what this is, I mean, I, I don't expect that I will be making it into a Catholic Memorial English class uh, 50 years from now. But some of these books have lasted a good long time at this point. And in terms of the life of any work of popular fiction, they have lasted, uh, they have lasted a tremendously long time. And, of, and, and, and I'm proud of that. Well, 40 years is a long time. And yeah. um, as, as we think about these worlds that you recreate and do so um, very skillfully, um, a number of alums and students, um, Bernie class of 66, uh, my Hello, class of 67, uh, mm -hmm. current student, um, Gerby, class of uh, 24. They, they were um, asking about Lincoln and, and uh, what he was like as a person, what his yeah. leadership style was. How'd you, how'd you get interested in recreating the world of Lincoln in that, that Civil War period in Washington, D.C.? Well, this is one of those, was one of those books that was born of multiple parents in a way. I had always wanted to write a big novel about the Civil War, something, um, something that would travel with a character who goes through a lot of the experiences in the Civil War. Um, I had originally talked talked about doing something that would that would follow a a musket, uh, one of the rifled Enfield rifled muskets through the war, but um, that's what I wanted to write. And my agent had been preaching to me for years that I should do a book uh, in the vein of the one about George Washington that I wrote called Citizen Washington, um, to write a book in that vein about Lincoln. And my editor had been saying for many years that there was a great novel in the evolution of Lincoln's thought toward how he came to write the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. So I put all of that together. Uh, my desires and impulses and their advice. And one night over dinner, my editor said, well, what are you working on now? And I said, Lincoln. And he said, great. <laughs> and that was it. And he didn't really ask another question for two years uh, in relation to what the plot would be or how it would unfold or anything else. And everything began to evolve out of that. Uh, the book is called The Lincoln Letter. Uh, it has uh, that title because I really like the alliteration of that title. And since I was going to introduce or reintroduce my character, Peter Fallon, the treasure hunter, into the story, we had to have a treasure for him to search. And the letter is the jumping off point, but what's in the letter? What will that lead to? And I thought to myself, how about a Lincoln diary that describes the evolution of his thinking in the first year and a half or so of his presidency uh, that is going to lead him from where he is at the beginning at his first inaugural where he basically expresses his, himself to that first inaugural audience 
as a constitutional officer. I have no intention of interfering with the property rights of any state by which he meant slavery, property. Uh, my job, job is to defend federal property, collect the tariffs and taxes, and uh, deliver the mail. How did Lincoln evolve from that guy to the man who would, within two years, um, issue an Emancipation Proclamation that would proclaim that the slaves who resided in those states then in rebellion would then thenceforward and forever be free. That's a long span of thought and evolution that's going on in Lincoln's head across that period of time. And I thought, okay, if you can, if you can create some kind of a Lincoln diary and, and the readers will have to read it and get into it a little bit, that could make an amazing, uh, an, an amazing artifact that modern characters, and you know, these books, a lot of these books go back and forth in time, that the modern characters would just be uh, obsessed to get their hands on. So I sat down with a friend of mine uh, and pumped her for her opinions about this idea that friend being Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, mm -hmm. We've known each other for a long time. And I said, and I said, how about a novel in which Abraham Lincoln's diary is the artifact in which she said, say no more, say no more. You know what it was like in the White House. Here was Abraham Lincoln wandering the halls of the White House night after night, burdened, crushed, by the weight of the, 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 the sense of responsibility that had been placed upon his shoulders, looking for some place to unburden himself and never finding it. And now he has a diary that he's going to do this in. Can you imagine what this would be worth to scholars? Can you imagine what this would be worth financially? And I said, Doris, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and so, that was, that was how I decided that the Lincoln letter would be uh, the wedge into the story that would lead us toward the finding of the Lincoln diary. And, sure. Yeah, and so that, that's, how, that's how it gets going. But then there's, there's an enormous amount of work and study that you have to do after you've just gotten the plot hook. And, um, and you know, every book is different, but in some ways, everyone is the same. You always begin with research that is a mile wide and an inch deep. I could probably go around the room and tell you what the first book was that I read um, about research for every one of these books. Behind me there, that would be Walter Muir Whitehill's Topographical History of Boston, which is a famous book about the, the evolution of, of Boston. Over here, Samuel Eliot Morrison's Three Centuries of Harvard. You know, I could do this all night. Um, but uh, with the Lincoln letter, the first book I read was Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin. Sure. And, uh, and then I went from there. You begin with any, with a good historical novel, you begin with those mile wide and inch deep Kind, kinds of books. Not that the book is mile wide and inch deep, but you're, you're looking to understand it, uh, in it, understand the historical event, the context of it in the, in the broadest scope possible. And then later, as you get more deeply into the story, you will begin to bore holes down into the research. Uh, for example, you will say, well, what were they saying in Washington, D.C. on such and such a date about such and such a historical debate? You know, and there are a lot of debates in the book. And, and for that, you can read uh, some biography of Lincoln. Or if you're really interested, you go to the Library of Congress website that has all of the uh, digitized newspapers. And in, in my case, I read every issue of the Washington Daily Republican from 1861 to 1865 uh, 
as reproduced on the Library of Congress website. I basically read the news every day. And you know what they always say about uh, journalism, newspapers, the first draft of history. Well, it may be the first draft of history, but later on when you go back and you start reading some of the, the stories that you will see in a newspaper of a, at a particular moment in time, you, you can suddenly take yourself back there. You can be there. Sure. Uh, and, and what good historical fiction does, what all good storytelling does, but good historical fiction tries to put you on the other side of the timeline. It tries to put you in that place uh, in say April of 1865 uh, before the history has happened. And then you're going to create a story out of the history. And even though, for example, you may know that John Wilkes Booth will be successful uh, in his nefarious deed on Good Friday night of 1865, uh, as an author, I have to build suspense into that event somehow. Uh, and part of the way that I will do it is to get myself back there and read the newspapers uh, about that week and you would be amazed at how joyous the editorials are in the Washington newspapers now that the war is over and how thrilled everybody is and you you can you can also read the advertisements you'll know what they're serving in the restaurants uh, on the on the uh, in the restaurants up and down Pennsylvania Avenue and all of these things, all of these very small, specific details, an expression, by the way, that I first heard learning how to understand what Edgar Allan Poe was doing in a cask of Amontillado in September of 1964 at Catholic Memorial, where well, you can learn about how to draw the proper specific detail out of that newspaper and put it into your story and a reader will say, oh, wow, I'm back there. You know, I know how much it costs for a bowl of oyster stew at the, uh, at the, the, the Swan restaurant on Pennsylvania Avenue because this character is stopping there to have some. And all of that stuff starts to work like a, um, a great row of dominoes, you know, but they're ever increasing dominoes. So you're starting with these tiny little details and you push them over and pretty soon you're going bum, 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 bum. And all of a sudden you're looking into Abraham Lincoln's face and whatever I may tell you, as you look into Abraham Lincoln's face, um, you're going to believe because you've right. believed all these other details that I've laid out for you because I've done the research. How about Lincoln? You know, I, I was fascinated reading the book. It, there was a sense of Lincoln's, you know, his complexity in terms of how he thinks about things, mm -hmm. with his information, but he's also so relatable yeah. to just anybody who comes up to him on the street or, you know, uh, lower tier officers. Um, how did you try to get that across in the dialogue? Because it, it seemed to ring true to me from the things that I've read about Lincoln. Um, but you're, oh. you're fictionalizing. I mean, it's yeah. But but when you have a character um, who is likable and just comes through in the pages of almost every historian who writes about him, uh, you're ahead of the game. Sure. Uh, and if this character has a sense of humor, uh, you you've won. You've won already. And Abraham Lincoln, uh, as he used to say, uh, when people would criticize him for telling funny jokes and silly little stories sometimes, and say, if I, if I did not laugh, I would go crazy mm -hmm. um, because of the, the horrors and the darkness around him. Um, his humor, uh, it, it wasn't black humor, but it was born in many cases of... Uh, of profound unhappiness. We know that he also suffered from what uh, today would be called clinical depression from time to time. Um, but I, from the beginning, tried to get at him by showing, first of all, 
in, in the scenes where we first meet him in the novel, uh, in the War Department telegraph office, sitting in the middle of the night with young men who are working to uh, translate the dots and dashes that are coming from all the battlefield sites, turn those dots and dashes into um, absorbable information, you know, because of course it was all coming in in code and cipher and they had to, they had to uh, decode it and so forth. And Lincoln would sit up all night or, or half the night if there, was a, if there was a lot of news coming in, in the building right next to the White House where today's old executive office building is. And um, he couldn't sleep, he had insomnia he, because of the pressures that he was under. Uh, and he would just enjoy conversation with these young men. And he would also crack jokes. I read a book uh, and this is one of those rare seldom read um, uh, primary source memoirs written by a guy um, who's in the book and now I can't think, I can't think of his name, uh, in the telegraph office, uh, who wrote, wrote a memoir about 1903 and you can find it on the, um, uh, on Gutenberg or one of those uh, uh, books, books in the public domain, read it for nothing type sites, which is where I found it. And he described uh, a lot of his experiences night after night chatting with Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And there's a story that Lincoln tells almost every night uh, when he comes into the uh, telegraph office and he'd go through the pile of telegrams that would be waiting for him. Uh, and he'd, he'd get to the last one and these would be coming from General McClellan, they would be coming from Grant, et cetera, et cetera. And he'd read through them and he'd say, well, no more, I'm down to the raisins. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the young man finally asks him, what do you mean you're down to the raisins? And then he tells this long, this long, funny story about a little girl and her birthday cake, which has raisins in it. And I won't go into it all, but it has a good punchline. And I just, I read that in that, that obscure memoir. And I said, that punchline story down to the raisins is going into the novel and into one of the early scenes in the novel. And so it did. And and that helped me to, uh, to, to bring you close to Lincoln right away. Because what you will, will also happen in the first scene of that novel, uh, after, after Down to the Raisins, or before Down to the Raisins, I guess, um, Lincoln, the, the book begins on the night that Lincoln signs the Emancipation for the District of Columbia. Because don't forget, it's, Lincoln's part of the story is about emancipation. And that, on that night, because they had been emancipated, the, uh, the freed slaves of Washington, D.C. paraded around the, uh, paraded right by the White House, right down Pennsylvania Avenue. And the book opens with him watching and expressing a certain amount of displeasure that they're out past curfew that they are in essence doing the, the thing that Lincoln didn't like, which was uh, breaking the law because Lincoln, as I say, began as a constitutional lawyer and he would end as the moral, moral avatar of a new birth of freedom. So when we think about Lincoln, um, Bill, and you have said, um, why, why is he, the subject of probably more books than anybody other than perhaps Christ. What yeah. is the sort of the permanence and the, the continued curiosity uh, with Lincoln after all these books and all these years? Um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a hard question, but were you able to put your finger on some of the things that are just so intangible that well, yeah. people are drawn to them? It, it's all intangible. We could talk about it all night, but uh, in terms of American history, his, his story is almost Christ-like, up to and including the fact that he dies on Good Friday. 
or shot. He dies the next morning. But um, uh, you know, Lincoln's appeal isn't exclusively um, to Americans. It might be an exclusive. It might be an American story uh, that this what we like to consider the great American experiment comes to its closest moment of fracture and, and does fracture and then is, is brought back together again during his presidency. Uh, he applies all of his best understandings of the law and, uh, and then his, his accumulating knowledge about warfare. And he basically teaches himself a lot of uh, warfare and strategy across the span of those four years in order to finally build the army and finally find the right general to win it. Um, but while it's an, an American story, it has resonated with people around the world. Um, there's a, I remember reading when I was getting started writing this book, I think it's Tolstoy, who talks about going to a um, Cossack village somewhere on the plains of Russia in the 1860s or 1870s uh, to talk about Russian leaders. And the Cossacks all say, no, no, we don't want to hear about them. We want to hear about this, this Abraham Lincoln, hmm. this, the greatest man in the world. And Karl Marx watched uh, from his perch in Europe as the Civil War unfolded. And uh, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, Karl Marx said, we have seen the end of the constitutional struggle of the Civil War, and now we see the revolutionary struggle of the Civil War. People saw in, Link in the evolution of Inc Lincoln's thought uh, a kind of revolutionary process. So he resonated across the globe as, as a result of that. And, um, you know, you take this whole package of likability, of, of personal tragedy that he endured, uh, which included the death of his son, Willie, in the White House in, in the spring of 1862. You take that, um, you take that, that joy in the last week, which is going to be shattered. I mean, how, you, you cannot imagine how crushed Americans must have felt after having endured 600,000 deaths, that one more, that one more death, the death of the president, the final martyr of the Civil War. Uh, you cannot imagine how crushing that must have been. So all of these aspects of the story get fed into that growth of what you could call the Lincoln myth. There are, there are revisionist historians who talk about uh, the Lincoln industry uh, and, and historians like Doris Kearns Goodwin who have written quite spectacular books about Lincoln. Um, so you have a tremendous amount of, uh, of material that you can just feed in all of it um, real, but it all leads toward that word that you're talking about, which is intangible, this sure. great intangible sphere of Lincolnia that, uh, that makes him so significant and important. And, you know, as we transition and talk about Lincoln and another great president, Franklin Roosevelt, I um, mean, you've alluded to this uh, earlier in our conversation. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your, your next book, which I understand, um, you just completed December forty one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, I finished another novel. It's always, uh, it's always a great feeling when you complete one of these things. The younger people out there who are laboring over term papers, as I say, I know how you feel. Um, and the new, the new book is a World War II thriller as I was saying, that uh, begins in Los Angeles and ends in Washington, D.C. It only covers a couple of weeks of time uh, from December 8th 
to the denouement on December 26th, 1941. And um, took me a long time to write. Friends of mine have been saying for years, you know, Bill, you write these novels that cover four years of the Civil War or Cape Cod begins in a thousand AD. Why don't you do something that lasts a couple of weeks and you'll write it so much more quickly. And of course, December 41 only covers two and a half weeks. And it, it took me about two and a half years to write it. Uh, but I have, I, I feel very satisfied about it. And, uh, um, it's a different kind of adventure. And you will get to look at the United States as it was plunged into war. You begin in Hollywood, you ride the super chief across the country, you experience what life was like in America in 1941. Uh, and, and then you have, uh, as your historical characters, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. How can you go wrong? Um, yeah. Roosevelt, like Lincoln, I think, uh, was somewhat difficult to get at. Uh, superficially, a guy who loved jokes, loved to crack jokes and so forth, but was even more close to the vest, even more manipulative than Lincoln ever thought to be. So it's been interesting to explore with him as well. Well, I, I think there are many of us who can't wait for that to come out. And um, uh, speaking for myself, I, I just wanted to say thank you for this conversation. And from the bottom of my heart, um, just a pleasure to, uh, to hear you speak uh, when we have the chance to do so. And thank you for um, your interaction with our students and alums. And I'm going to ask um, Tanya Collins to, um, to offer some closing remarks. Thanks to all of my friends at CM. It's great to see you all. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. That was really insightful. And I can't wait for the movie to come out, The Lincoln Letter. And it sounds like someone's been really busy during the pandemic. Yes. Um, and I wanted to also offer our deepest thanks to uh, Mr. Bradley, too, for helping us out tonight and hosting this event and to all of our audience members for logging in. We know that you're on virtually a lot, so we really, really appreciate it. Um, also, I just wanted to let those of you who uh, have the gala on your schedule know that we do have a special auction item from Mr. Martin as part of the gala. So you're just gonna have to log on in, on May 8th to find out what that is. Um, in the meantime, we hope you have a great, great evening and stay tuned for our next virtual event, which is a young alumni event on men's mental health. Thank you everyone, have a great night.